Hello and welcome back to Be A Loser. Well, we've discussed a lot in this series and hopefully it's becoming clearer to you that how we actually gain weight is far more complex than most people realize. And while the process of gaining weight is pretty complex, it basically boils down to one main hormone, insulin. Weight gain isn't a calorie imbalance. It's not an exercise or activity imbalance. It's not even a carb, protein, or fat imbalance. It's a hormonal imbalance. And yes, the hormone that's typically out of balance in most cases is insulin. But as we've touched upon in several other videos, it's not the only hormone that if out of balance can cause weight gain. And that hormone is cortisol. So take a deep breath calm yourself and let's learn what we can about how cortisol makes us fat. So what exactly is cortisol? Well, cortisol is part of a class of steroid hormones known as glucocorticoids. This name is a combination of glucose, cortex, and steroid due to the fact that these types of hormones regulate glucose metabolism, are created in the adrenal cortex, and are steroids. The adrenal glands where cortisol is created are triangle-shaped organs on top of the kidneys. We can think of cortisol as an alarm system for us designed by nature. It's the body's stress hormone, and it influences some parts of the brain to control mood, motivation, and fear. Cortisol controls our fight or flight responses to stimuli that we encounter. In essence, it's produced in response to stress. Now, if we think back to our ancient ancestors, as we often do here, then we can see that this cortisol release would be in response to physical stress, perhaps being in danger of being killed by something with fangs and claws. Now, as cortisol is released, it increases our alertness and reduces our need for sleep. Glucose availability is also greatly increased, and this has the effect of providing energy to our muscles. Obviously, this was important to our ancestors so that they could avoid being killed and eaten by other predators. In order to survive the stressful period, all other metabolic functions are stopped so that all available energy can be used for survival. This includes both growth and digestion. All available proteins are broken down and used for gluconeogenesis, which we know is the creation of new glucose in the liver. So, to put all of this simply, when we feel a life-threatening stress, cortisol is produced to give us lots and lots of glucose to fuel us getting away and surviving. In our ancient ancestors example, this excess glucose for energy would be used up through physical exertion aka running like hell. After the threat had passed, they were either dead or out of harm's way. As the stress diminishes, the cortisol levels return to normal. The short-term increase of glucose was dealt with by the body through the physical exertion and the balance was therefore maintained. That's how the body is designed to work. So, at first glance, cortisol seems to have the opposite purpose of insulin right? I mean, insulin is designed to store glucose as fat, while cortisol is designed to release glucose for energy. One hormone, insulin, stores, and the other hormone, cortisol, releases. So how on earth can they both make you fat? And the answer is time. Isn't it always? <laughs> Under short durations of stress, insulin and cortisol do play opposite roles. But this isn't the case under long durations of stress. Remember that for our ancestors, cortisol was generally released in response to physical stress. However, in today's world, we live under constant levels of non-physical stress. I mean, 
Think about all the aspects of your life that cause you stress. Marriage, work, kids, money. They're all around us all the time. And so, because we're chronically stressed, we have chronically high levels of cortisol. And because these stressors are not physical, there's no physical exertion to bring the cortisol and glucose levels back to a normal range. So, because the glucose levels are so high for so long, they can stimulate the release of insulin. Cortisol levels can rise from just perceiving stress. And this rise is accompanied by increases in glucose and insulin levels. In studies where patients were given doses of synthetic cortisol, known as prednisone, insulin levels rose 36% over five days of dosing. Another study showed that prednisone use increased glucose levels by 6.5% and insulin levels by 20%. Over time, insulin resistance develops in the liver, and this, of course, leads to obesity and even type 2 diabetes. And it doesn't end there. Glucocorticoids actually interfere with the entire insulin signaling network. This leads to insulin resistance in these skeletal muscles. These muscles also release amino acids for gluconeogenesis, causing even further IR. And if that weren't enough, the glucocorticoids suppress adiponectin secretion from fat cells. So why should we care about that? Well, adiponectin is released to help increase insulin sensitivity. And so we know decreased insulin sensitivity leads to obesity. Ouch. <laughs> Persistent high levels of cortisol are not good. Of course, persistent high levels of any hormone is not good. So the flip side of this coin is that if high levels of cortisol increase insulin, well then low levels of cortisol should reduce insulin. Well, patients who have received transplants are maintained on prednisone, synthetic cortisol, for many years in order to control rejection of the new organ. Once they're weaned from this prednisone, their blood insulin levels drop by 25%. This equates to a 6% weight loss and a 7.7% decrease in waist size. Now, as we've previously discussed in other videos, Cushing's disease is a disorder of too much cortisol. High blood sugar and type 2 diabetes are present in one third of all cases. Patients taking long-term doses of prednisone often develop similar symptoms to those with Cushing's disease and are diagnosed with Cushingnoid appearance. This is due to fat being redistributed in peculiar ways, particularly to the face and back. Nevertheless, the hallmark of Cushing's and Cushingoid is weight gain. 97% of patients demonstrate this weight gain as well as insulin resistance. But you don't have to have Cushing's in order to gain weight from cortisol. In a study in Scotland, cortisol secretion was associated with higher BMI and waist measurements. The heavier people were, the higher their cortisol levels. And these elevated levels of cortisol tend to lead to fat deposits in the abdomen, which results in an increased waist size. As we already know, abdominal fat is actually more dangerous for health than generalized fat, meaning equal fat distribution around the body. That's right, guys. A beer belly is very unhealthy. But moving on, as we've seen, high levels of cortisol cause weight gain. And as we know, low levels of cortisol help with weight loss. We've also seen this from a previous video through a disorder known as Addison's disease. This disease is caused by damage to the adrenal glands, resulting in very low levels of cortisol. And the hallmark of this disease is weight loss. Again, 97% of patients 
exhibit weight loss. So, if lowering cortisol can help us lose weight, then the question is, how do we lower cortisol? And the answer is, reduce your stress. It's just that simple. <laughs> yeah, right. Now, I know it's difficult to reduce stress. And as is typical, the ways that we think will reduce it aren't actually very effective. Watching TV or going to a movie doesn't really help much. Remember that the design of the body and those glucocorticoids is for physical exertion. So the answer to reducing stress needs to be a physical one. So this would include yoga, quiet meditation, massage, and exercise. Now, one of the hidden stressors that we haven't discussed yet is sleep deprivation. Even one night of sleep deprivation can raise cortisol levels 100%. If we look at sleep habits for the past 100 years, we can see a significant decline in time spent sleeping. Back in 1910, people slept on average nine hours a night. In 1960, they slept anywhere from eight hours to just under nine hours. By 1995, this was down to seven hours. And today, more than 30% of adults aged 30 to 64 sleep less than six hours per night. Population studies show a relationship with shorter sleep and weight gain, with the typical cutoff being seven hours. One study showed that for every extra hour of sleep, there's a 50% reduction in risk of obesity. And another study showed that sleeping less than five hours per night increases the risk of obesity a whopping 91%, and five to six hours of sleep still showed a 50% increased risk. And of course, I just have to point out here that these results really fly in the face of calorie model proponents, right? I mean, if you sleep less and are awake more, then presumably you are moving more and burning more calories, which should lead to weight loss. But of course, as we know, the opposite is true. Poor calorie counters. But seriously, I, I do feel sorry for them. Okay, but before we decide that sleeping 12 hours a night will make us all slender reeds, one study did show that sleeping more than eight hours per night can also increase risk of obesity by 60%. But too little sleep is still far worse. Sleeping less than six hours is associated with a 200% increase in obesity risk. So what's going on when we lose sleep that causes us to get fatter? Well, we know that lack of sleep increases cortisol levels a lot. This causes the brain to use less glucose, which accounts for the mental fogginess that we experience when we're sleep deprived. A study showed that sleep deprivation alone can lead to insulin resistance. Volunteers were restricted to four hours of sleep per night, and after six days, their insulin sensitivity had decreased by 50%. As we know, hormones are released according to circadian rhythms. Leptin and ghrelin are both affected by lack of sleep. Leptin, the satiety hormone, normally increases with more sleep, and this has the effect of reducing body fat. Ghrelin, the hunger hormone, decreases with more sleep, thus decreasing hunger. Less sleep equals more ghrelin equals more hunger. Being sleep deprived by four hours for two nights increased ghrelin and thus hunger by 28% and decreased leptin and thus satiety by 18%. This is why we feel hungry late at night and also, coincidentally, why fast food restaurants are open late as well. Essentially, sleep deprivation is causing stress and this is increasing cortisol and this in turn can lead to more sleep deprivation. Yes, stress can cause sleep deprivation as well. Increased cortisol activates our fight or flight response and can thus result in insomnia due to an excess of energy. So, how do we actually get a good night's sleep? Well, first of all, as I always recommend, let's try to stay away from drugs or sleep aids 
as these can actually interrupt your normal sleep rhythms. Now, natural ways are always better. I mean, after all, this is be a loser. Okay, so here are some tips courtesy of Dr. Fung. Sleep in complete darkness. Sleep in loose fitting clothes. Keep your bedtime and wake time as consistent as possible. Sleep seven to eight hours per night. See the light first thing in the morning. Keep your bedroom slightly cool. And do nothing but sleep and be amorous in your bedroom. No TVs. And that's it for this video and this series. I'll be starting a new series soon based on how to lose weight. So if you're new to the channel, please subscribe so you don't miss anything and enable alerts by clicking the bell so you know when new videos post. Also, please like the video and share it with friends and family as that does help me out with gaining exposure. Now, I've also launched a Patreon page, so if you want an easy way to support the channel, you can head over there and check it out. As always, thank you so much for watching, and until next time, keep being a loser.